Hello, everyone, and welcome to OncoDaily. I'm Amalia Sargsan, a medical oncologist and the head of research and intelligence here. And today I have an honor of welcoming Dr. Benjamin Schlechter from John of Arbor Cancer Institute with us. Hello, Dr. Schlechter, and thank you for accepting our invite and being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's great to talk again. So before we start discussing the latest updates you presented at SMO GI, can you briefly discuss on your role, what you do, and what are your interests in the field? Sure. So I'm a GI medical oncologist at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and I see primarily colorectal cancer, but other GI malignancies. My clinical area of interest is in rectal cancer and colon cancer um, in advanced disease setting. And my research interest is in finding new ways to use immune therapies in these cancers, both really novel cellular therapies and the next generation of immune checkpoint inhibitors to try and get patients access to immune therapy in colorectal cancer, where frankly, They've not had access to those before, except in very rare situations. Thank you for sharing this with us. And from a cellular therapist, I think this aligns very good. And then immunotherapies in the field. Uh, can you briefly uh, let us know what was the trial and data you have presented during ESMO GI and uh, briefly uh, discuss the uh, trial population? So the trial that we presented was a subset of the C801 study. So that was a clinical trial, a phase one dose escalation study of botancilumab, which is a next generation CTLA-4 inhibitor in combination with a PD-1 inhibitor called balstilumab. And we presented the data on colorectal cancer. And that's very important. So this trial, uh, it was a very large phase one trial with many different diseases. But one of the early observations was that patients with colorectal cancer had responded, and in particular, patients without non with non-hepatic disease, without active disease in the liver. And that was an interesting finding and a compelling finding. So the trial ended up expanding to include 123 patients with metastatic colorectal cancer, very refractory disease, who had no active liver metastases, either as a consequence of ablation or surgery, or just because they never had it. And they received botancilumab at two different dose levels with balstilumab. The there were several principal findings here. One of the most important findings is that we saw efficacy. There's never really been an immune therapy only efficacy signal in standard colorectal cancer, microsatellite stable and mismatch repair proficient colorectal cancer. It's a disease where numerous clinical trials have been negative. So the first finding is that it could work. The second finding that we presented, and this is a really interesting one, was that patients who had had two or fewer li- two or more lines of therapy you know, the prior Fulfox, Volfiri, that population, compared to those who had prior Fulfox, Volfiri, Lonser, Frequentinib, Regrat, the multiple line patients, the most refractory patients did exactly the same as those with fewer lines of therapy in terms of benefit and in terms of toxicity. So one of the challenges for chemotherapy is that the more chemo you give, um, the more patients struggle with toxicity and the less benefit they get. And so later lines of therapy tend to get kind of worse and worse and worse. Whereas in this advanced disease population, what we saw was the broad signal for efficacy and safety was essentially identical, whether it was after 5 of oxyplatin and arena tecan or after that plus Lonser, Frequentinib, Regorafin, those very refractory diseases. So those were both really very novel and important findings that one, it works in non-hepatic colorectal cancer, and two, it works in even the most treatment refractory diseases. Wow, that's very impressive to hear, is I can understand they're very heavily protruded population, which have uh, already exhausted all other lines of the treatment, and you just give something that works even in this situation. So previously, uh, immunotherapy was believed not to be working in this MSS uh, population. What makes this drug different? So what is uh, the secret that uh, it makes working and use of the efficacy? What do you think? So there are several observations going back several years about um, how immune checkpoint inhibitors fail and succeed in patients. And there's a couple modifications to botancilumab that that take advantage of these discoveries. So first of all, it's been known for some time that liver mets do differently than non-hepatic disease. We should think of the liver as an organ of tolerance. So for example, if you take a mouse model or a pig model, where this research was done generations ago, and you transplant on skin, for example, onto, onto a mouse from another mouse, so you have a donor, an allo donor skin transplant, and um, it's going to be rejected. We know that that's going to happen. That's why we all reject organs, for example. That's why we can't so easily transplant organs. But if you transplant the liver and another tissue like skin, that induces tolerance. And so there's an observation that the liver is an organ of tolerance, which means that metastatic disease in the liver, unfortunately, also becomes an organ of tolerance. And so liver metastases 
generate an immune suppression in a unique and special way. And so botanilumab is not addressing that, although I think there's interesting science to discuss about how we could fix this problem. But in patients with non-hepatic disease who don't have this problem with tolerance of their cancer, there is a potential if we can reduce immune suppression to actually generate significant activity in this population. So botanilumab does a couple of things. Number one, it more potently engages engine presenting cells. And number two, it also recruits NK cells. And then finally, it doesn't uh, fix complement, which has more to do with mitigating toxicity. The consequence is an agent which more potently suppresses or clears regulatory T cells and likely retracts and attracts NK cells into that suppressive tumor and microenvironment in nodal metastases, in lung metastases, in primary disease, perineal disease, bony disease, and results in activating a potent immune response like we see in the so-called hotter tumors like lung cancer and melanoma and whatnot. So that's what the botanilumab does. We don't want that to go on forever. Um, you know, persistent activation of the immune response will eventually lead to toxicity. And so the balsilumab, that's the PD-1 inhibitor. And that has to do with exhaustion of the immune response. So botanilumab in a potent and new way activates that primary immune response in these non-tolerant tissues. And then balsilumab allows that to continue in a safe way. And so the combination is more than either single drug alone. That seems that they're very potent and potently activating immunity. And uh, does it come also with toxicity? How do you manage and how do you see the safety profile? What would you suggest and recommend the other clinicians dealing with the same situation? I'm hoping that we're all going to be dealing with this drug soon because hopefully we can get FDA and EMA approved. Um, so so botanilumab is similar to CTLA-4 inhibitors. It is a little bit um, distinguished, a little bit differentiated from them. So number one, we don't see some of the toxicities that you see in other CTLA-4s like hypothesized. It's actually very, very uncommon with, with this agent. However, tissues that are deeply dependent on T-regulation and T-reg regulation are more likely to develop immune-related adverse events. So there's a funny little way this drug behaves. So number one, immune-related adverse events are common to some degree. Something like 80% of patients are going to have something go on. The thing that you see that's a little bit different with this drug versus other CTLA-4 inhib inhibitors is an early activation syndrome, almost like uh, it's a febrile illness, a flu-like illness. It can be managed generally with things like Tylenol and NSAIDs, and a small subset of individuals need a short course of steroids to overcome that. It usually goes away within a number of days. And that can even manifest with some GI upset and things like that. That is different than the other principal toxicity, which is immune-mediated diarrhea and colitis. We're going to combine those terms for the purpose of understanding this because when you see diarrhea in a patient, there's going to be some people in a trial are going to code it as diarrhea and they're going to deal with it that way and others code it as colitis and deal with it that way. They're the same thing. So we can combine diarrhea and colitis into a single adverse event for these patients and something like 30 or 40% of patients will have some degree of immune-related diarrhea and colitis. This we manage in a number of ways. Number one, some patients it, it sort of mitigates withholding drug, and that's one way to do it. But importantly, we want to choose a steroid-sparing approach for managing immune-related adverse events generally, and in particular with colitis. Patients who develop colitis can often respond very quickly to infliximab, TNF inhibition, and rapid recovery with little or no steroids, just a few days of steroids. And by sparing patient steroids, you actually limit the immune injury. Keep in mind that steroids are an immune suppressant. Infliximab is an immune suppressant, but in a different way. Infliximab does not directly injure T cells. And so by using drugs like infliximab or even vedolizumab and Tivio, you can mitigate the immune suppression that you would get by using steroids. And so it's very, very important so that patients can maintain an effective antineoplastic response. Hmm. So uh, as I understand from what you already told, uh, that they are manageable, though they occur, but they usually speak about the response. And also there are ways to manage this adverse event. So especially with the good results that these drugs are also giving. And I would like to ask your opinion also, how durable are these responses? So is this working the same way as other immunotherapies for the MMR patients or it's a bit different? And what do you expect from it? It is like chemo. And yeah, I would like to hear your comments. Yeah. So like any immune checkpoint inhibitor, there's there are winners and losers, right? It doesn't work in as many people as we would hope. However, those people who have a response, there's a subset of individuals with very durable and persistent responses. The objective response rate in both the refractory and hyper-refractory population, that fourth line, late line population, we're approaching 20%. And those patients who have a, a deep response tend to have a persistent response. And so we see very prolonged survival in the responders. So the all population, there's good responses. But if you focus on those people 
who develop um, a deep response and a persistent response, somewhere around one to two years, the, the curves level off and survival just continues. And as a number of these patients remain off any therapy, even beyond the time course of the trials, they had two years of botanstilinab and balstilinab, they discontinued therapy for protocol, and now they continue off chemotherapy um, and doing really, really well. Some of these individuals have residual medrural disease by scan. And what we don't know is if that represents contained disease with an active immune response or if that's dead disease. Are those people remitted? Is that a complete response? Or are those patients with some immune management of their cancer, which with time may wane? And we don't know that yet, but it seems very, very clear that those patients with a deep and persistent response, in particular those who go out to two years, um, they seem to just keep responding and responding and responding and have ongoing disease control, which is really compelling and interesting. Oh, especially in this already heavily pretreated population, hopefully we're going to see more and more deep responses and identify those who respond good and understand why and what drives these responses to be so durable. So uh, in your vision, what's going to be the next? Is it going to be tested a bit frontline? So these are heavily pretreated population. Do you think the role will be even better if it is not that treated population? How to see the future going for the bulbot combination in MSS colorectal cancer? So beyond the data that we presented, there's very clear data that all lines of therapy seem to benefit from these agents. And that should not be unexpected because we've seen similar findings with other immune checkpoint inhibitors. So certainly in the most refractory population, there's a critical need. And so those patients um, will get access to this drug through clinical trials. And ultimately, that's the, the approval pathway is in refractory and hyperrefractory disease. And so that's one important population. There's investigation underway to look at earlier lines of therapy in metastatic disease, including first-line therapy. And those are data that's really just early presentations, but it's compelling. What's really interesting is there have now been two presentations across three clinical trials of non-metastatic disease. So there's the NEST 1 and 2 clinical trial of a single dose of botanstilimab followed by a one to two or three doses of balstilimab followed by surgical resection for colon cancer. And there was an improvement in response with time, and there were complete responses with even just a few weeks of therapy with potent and malstilimab. And so that is the NEST1, NEST2 trial. And there's the unicorn study out of Italy, which looked at potent and silimab plus or minus balstilimab in the same population, resectable colon cancer. And they also showed that potent and with balstilimab, not potent and alone, can achieve pretty impressive efficacy in even early stage disease such as stage two, stage three, measurable colon cancer, who then undergoes resection. How to put that into context and how that's going to benefit patients, I think remains to be seen. It's a little too early to start giving people neoadjuvant immune checkpoint inhibitors, but it's compelling to know that we can do this. And it speaks to other diseases where neoadjuvant therapy can be helpful. And in particular, diseases like rectal cancer. And so there's a lot of thought going into how to use this in all stages of colon cancer from resectable disease to hyperrefractory disease. And my expectation would be that as we move to earlier lines of therapy, we may see differential and improving responses. It's important to know that primary disease like a colon cancer or rectal cancer has the native immune system of the organ, the colon. It also has that training ground of the lymph nodes. And so that, that boot camp for the immune system may provide additional support for the immune response and may may promote deeper and more persistent responses. And that's why, for example, if we look at MMRD, colon cancer, a different disease, and if we look at advanced disease, we see excellent responses, right? But if we look at early stage disease, we see new universal responses. And so are near universal responses, let's not overcall it. But, you know, over 95% of patients have a deep response with resectable colon cancer in the new studies. Um, and so, that also, I think, tells us that as we move to earlier stages of disease, we may see, see improvement in response um, and beyond just it's not in the liver, but that there's something about primary only disease, which has a different immune response. That's uh, pretty remarkable. I understand how you're saying. So as in any a few of other diseases and uh, drugs too, started with the, those who have the most unmet need in heavily protruded and then moved it uh, earlier line if there is a deficit and here we clearly see the benefit. So now for now, uh, you have done the first phase one trial. It was the cohort of expanded. Uh, what is next coming? Where do you see the approval? Is it upcoming trials coming on and what is in the plan? 
So the phase one is done and we have very mature survival and toxicity data. We've learned how to manage toxicity. As I said, early initiation of TNF inhibitors really made a difference in mitigating toxicity. It went from manageable to also like manageable with good outcomes, which is always a wonderful combination. Um, we have completed a randomized phase two trial, which uh, answered several questions. First of all, what's the correct dose? Is it the 150 milligram, three milligram per kilogram or two milligram per kilogram or 75 milligram? It's equivalent to one milligram per kilogram of botencilumab. And we have readdressed the inclusion of baustilumab or not. And that was compared to chemotherapy in a phase two study. It was a five-arm study of botanzolumab 150 with or without baustilumab. That's two arms. Botanzolumab 75 with or without baustilumab. That's two arms. And a chemotherapy arm. And in that clinical trial, which was presented at GI ASCO in 2025 by Dr. Faki, uh, what was shown was that there were no profound, deep, and durable responses in the chemotherapy group. And that there were the best possible responses with the moderate dose of botanzilumab, 75 milligrams, fixed dose, and balstilumab. And so that would be the arm that we pursued in randomized trials and in uh, randomized registration trials. In terms of the registration plan, I can't speak for the regulators or for the company. There is a refractory disease trial that is under development. And that's an exciting area because refractory disease has the greatest need. But there's also investigator-sponsored and, and hopefully industry-sponsored trials coming. I think across the spectrum of disease in various combinations with chemotherapy, without chemotherapy, these are all fruitful areas for investigation. And they're all being investigated at once. We don't have to do things in a linear fashion. We can walk and chew gum as investigators. Thank you for sharing this with us. Indeed, uh, the unmet need is mostly in the heavily protruded population. These patients doesn't have any other option left. And if there is something that works, sometimes better than what is already there, of course, this should be addressed first. Hopefully, by the next time we have an interview, uh, we'll see more results coming and maybe from the registratory trials as well. Uh, thank you, Dr. Schlechter, for sharing the latest data on pulpboard trials across MSS colon cancer and do you have anything else to add for now? No, thank you for having me. It's great to talk about these data. This is an important time in immuno-oncology, important time in colon cancer. Um, I think we've begun to crack the nut of amine therapy in this so-called cold disease. I think we can put to bed the idea that colorectal cancer is a cold disease. Um, but I think we still have to address the liver issue. Um, and work is underway, and I think there's exciting times ahead. Thanks a lot, Lee. Uh, indeed, uh, it's challenging uh, to set the boundaries and what was known to be cold now is hot and we are treating in a different way the disease with a good way and good responses. Thank you for this interview. It was nice and pleasure to Thank have you. you today with us. Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.